Hey everyone, this is Chess Coach Aaron. How are you guys doing? And I'm here for a game of the Petrov Defense or Russian Defense. So I'll be doing three games to cover this opening. Um, and there are three major forks in the road for White, uh, how they'll respond to your uh, Petrov Defense. Um, so uh, I'll do one game for each fork in the road. I'm thinking that's the best way to go. And uh, let's get to the first game. But before we start the moves, just to let you know, Black is a famous American chess player by the name of Frank Marshall. Great attacking player. He never could quite crack the top five or really like top ten of the world. Um, he went to some major tournaments. He used to have to travel to tournaments, 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, around the world to these famous tournaments. And, um, and he did very well. But the top players, top five especially, top ten in the world, he couldn't quite beat. He was a great attacker, played a little bit risky, but uh, against the really best players, they were able to play very precise and defensive and see everything he was doing and kind of just control him, stop him, if you will. He was kind of like Mikhail Tell before Mikhail Tell came along. <laughs> but he loved to attack. So if a great attacking player loved to play the Petrov defense as black, well, it's something we have to think about too. The Petrov defense or Russian defense has a very uh, almost dry reputation, as if it's very drawish at best, like black's not playing to win. That is so not true. If anything, you're showing that you can get your army out as fast as white, and you're making a white prove that they have the first turn advantage. And that is one of the biggest arguments in chess, the first turn advantage for white. But let's play the first couple of moves real quick, and we're in the Petrov defense. And the main thing that most beginners especially are going to do is capture that pawn. It's there. It's not protected. Why not? They may try a bunch of other things, of course. And we talked about that in my video with the basics. Knight to c3s. Very big move, d4, very big move, bishop c4, very big move too. So these are some big moves um, that will be played. But the number one move will be for sure just a capture. And that was what was done here. Now, this is not a whole game. This is Marshall's black, and he actually got this type of position about six times in very uh, serious games. Um, and the position we're going to get to, it was actually made famous by him. Other people used it too. That they actually called it the Marshall Trap. <laughs> Not quite a trap, but you'll see what I mean. Anyway, so White's taking this pawn, seeing if Black understands to chase the knight away. Of course, Frank Marshall knows to chase the white away. Get it off your side of the board. Get it out of here. And then, only after you've chased their knight away, do you take your pawn back. Fair trades. Now, a lot of players will just move their d-pawn. Either one or two squares forward. This is one of the three forks in a row that I was talking about. Um, back in the uh, early 1900s, uh, one of the biggest things to do was to play d4 and follow it up with bishop d3 and c4. Because when they play d4, usually play, black plays d5. Then you play bishop d3, putting pressure on the knight. You can castle right away, but the only thing defending the knight after black plays d5 is this d-pawn, and then you pressure with the c-pawn. You'll see exactly what I mean. So this was very popular for a long time. Trying to prove that this knight actually was not uh, a smart place for it to be so early in the game on the white side of the board, that it wasn't protected properly. It was overextended, maybe. Uh, but I would much rather have an active knight. It's already on their side of the board. Knights are slow. It's in the sweet center, and I think black can actually get it to stay there. But this was a very common treatment for a long time. And still today, you'll see a lot of players play the same way. So they move their d-pawn forward, not chasing the knight away, but they could chase the knight away. They put their bishop on d3. Now they can castle. And they're putting pressure on the knight, which means c4 puts pressure on the protector of the knight. All right. Here, though, and very smartly, Black grabs the opportunity to pin their knight and get this light squared bishop developed. Many players will actually play something like h3, and I'm talking about, you know, masters and strong players, grandmasters, very good players. They'll play this on purpose to take this key square away and not let the dark squared bishop get to this diagonal. Because afterwards, right, if you still play h3, now the bishop can back up and it's still on this diagonal, keeping this pin, which can be annoying. And it gives black some possibilities, right? Bishop d6, very strong, can still castle short. Knight can go and attack this pawn, which is now pinned. And this bishop becomes very active. So by playing an early h3, perhaps, some players are trying to 
make black prove that this uh, light squared bishop can get happy. So that's an argument. I mean, many times in chess, um, many openings, these are the arguments. How do you make your pieces strong and weak? Here, we're talking about the light squared bishop. But all right, bishop d3 is played. Black immediately pins that knight. White castles, makes sense, right? And bishop d6. Now notice, this dark squared bishop is very aggressive. It kind of is the same as their light squared bishop, aiming at these h pawns because once you castle the f pawns aren't as weak it becomes the h pawns that are a little bit more of a target right but let's also take a quick look three tall pieces minor pieces three tall pieces for black are out and about developed happy and instead for white it's two of them and a third development move is a castle but the knight is pinned so is it as good as this bishop is it as good as this knight but their king is not castled yet, or our king is not castled yet. So this is the trade-off. So black's actually a little bit ahead in the peace, happiness, and development. A little bit. So white should actually be very careful. So let's run through some more of the moves. Two attackers now on the knight and is pinned. So should black castle? Why no? Because they'll lose at least a pawn. I mean, I'd give up the, the bishop for a knight and win this pawn if I'm white. Why not? Um, and instead, what Marshall used to do is he would bolster this knight. He would make it super strong. Now it's like a rock. It's protected by two pawns. So if they capture, a pawn will take it and pile on this pin knight. So white's got to be a little careful, right? And now that this knight is still pinned, I mean, now that it's still pinned, not that it's uh, able to move or it shouldn't move, right, because it's pinned to the queen, White's not going to be able to play f3 for a long time and attack this pin knight, and really black can get out of the pin pretty quickly. And that is kind of what happens. Finally, white does this maneuver, c4, to attack a defender of the knight. But there's another defender. And notice, white hasn't removed one of the defenders yet, so there's still two defenders. That knight is safe for one move, and Marshall would take the opportunity to get the king out of the center. Knight is not pinned. But what about this pawn? And this was the position that they actually named the Marshall trap. And let's show what happened first, and then we'll go through some ideas of what white maybe could do, because we're just talking about the opening. We're not playing the whole game. But again, Marshall got this position about six times in serious games, and quite a few other players also got this type of position throughout the years. Um, even in the past couple of years, some good players still play this type of uh, opening and position, this idea. All right, so what does white do uh, you know the reason why they play c4 is to undermine the protection of the knight okay but this is actually what marshall was looking for and the activity of these pieces and the queen's included here right this knight can be removed or it's pinned so the queen has great places it might go to aiming at the king side aiming at the king side aiming you know perhaps at the king side a lot of activity for black already and you'll notice White's spent a little time trying to undermine this knight, right, instead of developing pieces. So two pieces over here in the queen side for black, not moved. This is actually three. And black queen has more happy place to go, less than the white queen. So the only thing is, you know, yes, they made this work very active on an open line. But right now this knight, which was protected by two pawns especially, is saying, no, I'm blocking up this line. All right. So here's the trap. They take a pawn, and suddenly the surprising bishop takes h2. Check. And notice, this is only going to work so many times at the top level of chess, because people are going to see these games that black does this, and they're not going to allow this to happen, you would think. And again, after a while, it didn't happen so much at the top level. Marshall got this position here. Let's back it up. Boop, boop, boop. After casting, he got this position here about six times, and then the white players start doing different things to combat this trap. <laughs> but we're really talking about the opening. And notice how active black's pieces are already. Black could just play c6 and try to protect this pawn too, by the way. Um, instead of casting, it could try that. But all right, so they take the pawn, and it, black gets a pawn right back with check. But wait a minute, how does this work, Coach Aaron? Well, let's see how the moves work. Well, the king captures the bishop in check. You're not capturing with the knight because you lose the queen. So they take with the king. All right, and notice the king was the only thing protecting the f-pawn at this point. It's been deflected away, and I just did a video on deflections. So the king's deflected away from protecting the f-pawn. And notice earlier, white had used this rook on the e-line to pin the knight and aim for the black king. It no longer protecting it, so nothing's protecting the f-pawn. Nice. Snack. So we get the f-pawn. But again, we gave up a whole piece. Coach Aaron, what's going on? Well, there's more to this. For example... 
it's hard to see here but this rook might be lost in this position can you see it well it's not easy to see but right now we're attacking a queen attacking a bishop which means when the queen moves we take the bishop so the queen will take back. You would think they save the queen by moving it, right? And then when you take the bishop, then the queen will take that. All right. But still, the rook is not available for black. What are you talking about, Coach Aaron? Well, again, the only thing protecting the, the rook is the knight. So you remove the defender. This queen here might take or the pawn might take. But either way, this knight was also covering h4. And guess where our queen can go? h4 with check. And what does it fork? It forks that rook, which queen moved away, and you remove the knight. There's no defenders of the rook. So for that bishop, you'll get a pawn or two, and you'll get the rook if white goes through all the moves. Let's keep going so you can actually see it, all right? So I know it's hard to see from here, but I, I wanted to say it from here. And this is not easy. Queen e2, save the queen. Still protecting the bishop. All right, capture the bishop. All right, so queen will take. And now it becomes a little clearer. We'd love to play queen h4 check and capture this rook, but right now the knight's still there. And because the queen moved, it's not pinned. Well, easy thing to do is just remove the defender. Boop, a little in-between move. Now there's no defender. There's no knight protecting the rook on e1, which means either way that white captures back, you will now have a fork and get that rook, right? Queen takes, got checkers, and this is as far as I'm going to go with the opening moves that Marshall used. And again, I think he got this position only twice. And one other player, a really good player 30 years later, I think also got the same position. So this position has occurred three times, I think, in top-level chess, maybe even four times. But notice people will start doing different moves, not trying to let this trap happen. And it's not so much a trap as it is that black just has a lot of activity. And um, what do we mean by activity? It just means your army's coming out and your pieces are happy and have good choices. And that is the essence of the Petrov defense, the Russian defense. Notice, they're not chasing the knight away. I think most beginners should play d3 just like black played d6 to chase away the white knight. They should chase away the black knight. Run away, now pawn forward, pawn forward. And we're already looking at a very equal game. White still has that first turn. But notice, for both sides, all the bishops, both sides have the bishops happy. Both sides have the same type of development. It's pretty equal. White just has that first turn advantage, which they have normally at the beginning of the game anyway, but black's doing wonderful. So that's probably what beginners should do if, if they're going to move the deep on. But by leaving the knight here, they're allowing a little more activity, right? Because this knight is aiming into the camp for white. Um, if they bring the knight out early, whoops, the knight out early now, you could always double pawns maybe. Um, you're putting pressure on the F pawn. And, you know, I mean, this is blocking up the E line, which means as long as black and castle, this is a very strong knight. All right, so bishop d3, very normal development, but it does allow black now to pin. And you could do something like this, right? And notice the bishop's got a great place to go if you keep chasing it. It can go to g6, protecting the knight. This, this is very fine position for black nothing wrong with that and by the way don't be surprised there'll be times when you can still castle long you know it's not the end of the world if you try to castle long here especially if white starts to expand over here why not you haven't castled yet all right but white castled and bishop d6 fantastic place for the bishop and the petros one of the reasons why you want to get your pawn to d5 fantastic place all right, so they're making their rook not protect the f-pawn, and it looks very active, very strong. Here, Marshall takes a move to move the f-pawn early, something that I say to beginners not to do all the time. But he played, like I said, a little bit risky kind of chess, and he loved to attack. But he knew to make this knight really strong, very important. All right, so c4, attacking the pawn, and here, black castled. And here we have the position we talked about, the trap. Offering this pawn, the d-pawn, but now we get to take, boom, over on h2. And maybe if white plays badly, get a good attack. Now, if black takes that bishop, which we talked about, that actually is probably one of the big mistakes because now that's allowing this pawn to be captured by the knight and black's probably slightly better, if not very much better. Instead, what white should do here, if they're going to take this pawn and trade pawns basically is they really should move the king over to f1 looks a little bit like hmm are you sure about that coach Aaron? but it protecting this f pawn not allowing the knight a free uh pawn plus more attacking maneuvers is probably the right way 
right way to go. <laughs> and notice, it's true, there are a lot of pieces still in this area. But, you know, if white uh, and white can probably get some pieces out and make some trade here. Like right now, they have two things aiming at this knight. And notice the knight can't take that up on anymore. Or it can, but it's just not a good move. So suddenly, it's a, it's a big difference. All right, so king over is one option. But here are some other options real quick in this position. Taking, not so good. But now that you know this idea, and again, I think black's already equal here. We're not talking about winning or losing necessarily, but equal. Our pieces are happy, king is safe, and we have a good position for black. But what should white do? They should not take the pawn. Instead, they have a lot of options. Bishop e2. Well, that unpins this knight, which means the knight can capture if the bishop takes. All right, very simple. They have knight b to d2. Uh, protects this pawn, gets another piece developed, putting more pressure on this knight, and protects this knight. Excellent. That's possible. They have c5, a surprise maneuver. And we'll look at this line real quick, and then we'll be done. But c5 going forward, which is kind of weird, you would say, because you're playing c4 to undermine this knight. But is the knight really undermined? I mean, the answer would really be no. And if anything, attacking this bishop, because now bishop takes, is not good for black. You would think, hey, playing c5 and you're making black do this move. Well, I'll show you why in a moment it's not good. But anyway, so we're going back to this position. And so far we had c takes, not so good because the bishop takes h2. Uh, we had bishop running back, unpinning, helps a little bit. We got knight developing, can help. We had c5, which I'll show in a moment why it works. And then we also have bishop b3, another piece to develop, by the way, but it also protects the f-pawn, which makes this not a good sacrifice because the knight will not be able to take that pawn safely. So even bishop to e3 was interesting. And notice by going forward, a lot of complications can arise, but now there's one less defender here. So there's a lot of stuff going on. It's, it's, it's very spicy and just a lot of stuff going on. Now they can try to chase that bishop here, but notice then our bishop doesn't reach h2. So it kind of stops our attack also. So the bishop can back up now if you want, either spot. But let's get back to the c5. Very interesting. And now you're going to say, Coach Aaron, why doesn't uh, this allow bishop h2 to work? Well, bishop takes h2. King takes h2. Knight takes f2. Looks very familiar, right? Queen e2. Got to save the queen. Protect the bishop. Knight takes, right? And now there's an in-between move which saves white. And that is simply a developing in-between attack in the queen move and stops the queen from reaching h4. So removing that knight later doesn't really help because the queen can't reach it. It's being attacked. Now, why does this work? Well, because this pawn is on c5, protecting, controlling d6. This queen cannot jump out of the way, queen d6, and say, check, right? And then we win material because we just captured a piece and we're attacking a rook. So this is not available. We would just lose the queen. Meanwhile, if we go to the main line that did occur, right? So here we are with the main line and notice the difference. Well, let's find that spot where the knight takes d3 here. And notice, knight takes d3. If they play bishop g5, now you can play queen d6. Now you have this check. There's no pawn on c5 stopping that. So by capturing here, this actually allows this escape escape maneuver and now we're taking a rook we have this knight pinned and black's doing wonderful versus this position boop where notice the difference instead of taking that pawn getting a pawn but letting black an attack we went forward if you're right and you control the square now this in between maneuver actually works we'll get our piece back and we'll stop them from attacking so even c5 in this position would have helped even though it's hard to find right? If you're thinking about removing this pawn. All right. So this is just to show you what Frank Marshall used to play or what you can play, get your pieces active if they don't chase your knight away, but they move their d-pawn to d4, um, which some players still do. And you should respond as soon as they play d4, not chasing your knight away. You should play d5 every time. Now, normally they're playing d4 right away to get their bishop to d3. They can castle and there's pressure. So this just makes a lot of sense. So you have some choices here. You could just play bishop d6 right away, uh, which is less risky than what Frank Marshall did. Bishop g4, though, the pin is really strong, but it's much riskier. This doesn't help castling for the most part, while bishop to d6 does. You can castle if they castle. 
So this is a little bit safer for black, and you can play f5 in a moment later if you want, or you can try to pin if they don't play h3. So you can play bishop d6 first, which would be safer if you don't want to play quite as risky for sure. But Frank Marshall used to love bishop g4. He used to love being active and getting pins, of course. <laughs> All right, so that was the first video of three games for the openings for the Petrov, and expect two more Petrov Russian defense videos. Let's get a quick joke in and we'll be done. What do you call two bananas? Hmm. Well, bananas are famous for being pretty good at chess. So two bananas would be a good chess playing game, perhaps, right? Two bananas. But that's not the number one answer. Two bananas I would call slippers. <laughs> All right, this is Chess Coach Aaron out. Peace.